topic of the lecture today is ischemic heart disease. In this lecture, we're going to learn about how an ischemia affects the heart and what are the pathological consequences of any kind of ischemia. So first of all, we have to know what heart ischemia is, what ischemic heart disease actually annotates. First of all, we need to know that what supplies heart with the blood supply. That's coronary vessels. We have all learned that the coronary vessels are solely responsible for providing the uh, heart with the blood supply. What if coronary vessels are not able to provide the heart with enough uh, blood supply to do its function? Ischemia will happen. When ischemia will happen, what will happen? Myocyte will die. And when they, then when they will die, the consequences are devastating. The heart won't be able to pump, won't be able to function as a pump, won't be able to contract properly, won't be able to relax properly. And that's why ischemic heart disease are very important. Now this is a depiction. Now these are coronary vessels which are supplying the heart, right? And now from the outside it looks like the normal vessel but when you look at the inside you can see the plaque formation, the atherosclerotic formation, the emboli formation. Any of those can happen and this can stop the blood supply going to this region of the heart. Whatever region supplied by this part of the vessel won't be supplied and when that when it won't be supplied there will be ischemia when there will be ischemia death of cell will happen when death of cell will happen heart won't be able to function as a pump because that area will be affected that area won't be contracting properly that area won't be doing its function as a pump so we have to learn what all of these terminologies and what all of these factors are that lead to the formation of this uh, ischemia so risk factors according to ischemia or risk factor which lead to ischemia are the following first of all we have age after the age of 40 or even you can say after the age of 30 <clears throat> the chances of developing ischemic heart disease are increased up to two folds up till the age of 80 afterward it stays the same Afterward, it doesn't matter, you're 80, you're 90, you're 100, you're 110. Chances have reached at its maximum level. Next on, we have sex. So, it has been studied and uh, multiple studies have revealed that male to female ratio in developing uh, ischemic heart disease is more. 4 ratio 1 in some cases and mostly in some cases 2 ratio 1. Is what has been seen in the studies that male population gets to have ischemic heart diseases more than female population but it goes on to a specific age till the old age afterwards they have the equal chances of getting the disease next time we have family history in family history the studies have revealed that the people or the families which turn to have uh, ischemic heart disease, they have more chances of developing this disease. They have more chances of developing this disease. So it can be said that it runs in the genome in some uh, families, in some populations. So they have increased uh, predisposition to getting this ischemic heart disease. Next, we have use of oral contraceptives. All the females, all the ladies who use oral contraceptives after the age of 30, after the age of 30 and smoke have more and more chances of getting ischemic heart disease. Next round we have sedentary lifestyle and obesity. Now sedentary lifestyle and obesity go on in the same way. Some people have external obesity, we can see it. Some have organ obesity, internal organs are obese. They are uh, surrounded by the fat. So sedentary lifestyle and obesity play a major role in getting the uh, ischemic heart disease because when you go through sedentary lifestyle, when you go through obesity, the lipid levels go up and up in your body. The levels of LDL shoot up and with the time passing, the plaques formation starts, the lipid start deposition and then plaques, are, uh, plaques will be formed, then the, those plaques will become thrombus and then thrombus will become emboli and eventually they'll stop the heart, they'll stop some vessel, they'll narrow some vessel 
and the heart won't get enough blood supply and then the heart won't get enough blood supply what will happen ischemia will happen next now we have personality features now this is interesting personality features there are two type of personalities type a type b type a personalities are those people specifically those people who are uh, aggressive who are uh, time conscious who have been throughout their life active now they have more chances of developing ischemic heart disease than those people who have sedentary lifestyle not sedentary lifestyle not in a way of not doing anything sedentary lifestyle that kind of lifestyle in which they didn't care about things they were not time conscious they were not uh, predisposed to this kind of uh, atmosphere now they have less chances of developing ischemic heart disease so type a personality all the people who have type a personality are going to get this disease they have more chances of getting this disease next one we have systemic hypertension what does systemic hypertension does when systemic hypertension happens more and more blood pressure is required more and more blood is pumped when it reaches up to a certain level then the coronary vessels won't be able to supply the heart with enough blood supply to sustain its maximum pressure sustain its blood pressure and when it won't be able to sustain its blood pressure the heart will fail the heart will go into ischemia if coronary vessels are not doing their proper job next one we have cigarette smoking studies have revealed that people who smoke cigarettes have more chances of developing ischemic heart diseases and over time it has been noticed that people who develop among the male population and female population who develop uh, who have more uh, recurrence of or occurrence of uh, ischemic heart diseases are smokers next on we have diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus is a bigger risk factor for all of these diseases diabetes mellitus is a gateway to all of these diseases when a patient is suffering from diabetes mellitus he's more prone uh, to getting any kind of disease because the immune system is down your glucose and your insulin systems are at war so they at better risk or more risk of getting all of these diseases next time we have elevated blood cholesterol levels when cholesterol levels increase the fat deposition increases the blood vessels in the blood vessels fat starts depositing then those atherosclerosis will happen then further on we have thrombus formation then we have emboli formation and people who have more ldl level are at higher chance of getting the ischemic heart disease on the other hand if they have uh, better hdl levels they are at better chance of not getting this disease so what we do is we get this ratio between them like what's the ratio what's the quantity of ldl present inside the blood if it's more it means that person is more prone to getting this kind of disease next now we have ischemic heart disease the causes of ischemic heart disease so first of all either it can be decreased blood supply of oxygen so how can the blood supply decrease how can the supply of oxygen decrease to the heart there can be two reasons first of all let's talk about decreased supply of blood due to any reason the supply of blood has been decreased that can be due to any kind of atherosclerosis that can be due to any kind of thrombus that can be due to any kind of emboli that can be due to any kind of aortic uh, vaso uh, constriction it can be because of any of these reasons so let's talk about it first of all we have atherosclerosis and thrombosis meaning that the artery lumen is not narrowed when the artery lumen is narrowed the blood won't be able to go to those area which is which this uh, blood uh, vessel is supposed to uh, you know deliver blood to it won't be able to provide the blood enough for the sustainment of that area of the heart when this was the lumen and the blood normally would go through and supply the heart now this lumen is blocked halfway now the blood is still going but it's not in the equal amount it was going before it's not in the proper amount it's not in the right amount so the heart won't get enough blood supply and that's what atherosclerosis and thrombosis will do next on we have thromboemboli thromboemboli means if thrombus formed at some place and then detached itself or somehow detached and moved to another place and blocked that area that's what thromboemboli means and it has the same pathophysiology the same lumen something is blocking the lumen the blood is not you know going through properly and it's not uh, getting to that area of the heart and 
ischemic heart disease will come up next one we have coronary artery spam if coronary artery have spam we don't have any occlusion we don't have any thrombus we don't have any emboli it's just that coronary artery which was this uh, much of a lumen has spammed the lumen has decreased it has gone into spam spam means contraction when that happens still the blood is not enough for that area of the heart and still ischemic heart disease will happen next time we have collateral blood vessels collateral blood vessels of the coronary vasculature are present but they are not active all the times but what if they become active what if they become active or develop more and more collaterals when does that when when does that happen it happens when thromboemboli or thrombus is blocking the main vessel which is supplying the heart so the collaterals will develop and then those collaterals will supply the heart but they won't be able they won't be enough the blood supply won't be enough and maybe it's supplying in the wrong regions maybe it's not supplying the major area with a major amount of blood vessel and that will lead to the formation of ischemic heart disease next up we have blood pressure cardiac output and heart rate blood pressure we talked about blood pressure just right now that the blood pressure when the blood pressure rises it means the heart needs more and more blood to pump more and more blood to surpass at 160 by 90 blood pressure so the demand of the heart will increase the demand of oxygen the demand of blood will of the heart will increase when the when that happens the heart is pumping at its maximum it needs more oxygen it needs more blood what happens if there is any kind of blockage any minute blockage and those vessels are not able to do its job patient is going to get ischemic heart disease then comes cardiac output if cardiac output is increased or decreased it has major role on ischemic heart disease then we have heart rate when it is more when it's more than normal or when it's less than normal both have consequences then we have miscellaneous we are going to talk about this miscellaneous in the upcoming slides next time we have conditions that influence the availability of oxygen in the blood what conditions can that be those conditions which influence literally influence the availability of oxygen that either oxygen is going to be delivered or not now the blood is not being affected the supply of blood is normal pathology lies within the availability of oxygen in that blood there is some problem due to which availability of oxygen has decreased in that blood let's see what those conditions are first of all we have anemia when anemia happens you all know hemoglobin goes down and the carrying capacity of oxygen goes down when the carrying capacity of oxygen goes down in hemoglobin or in the blood consequences are devastating it won't be able to supply the basic organs supply the basic structures with normal oxygen levels when anemia is happening patient is not uh, able to give its own own heart enough oxygen because oxygen carrying capacity has gone down and it will lead to ischemic heart disease next time we have shift in hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve there is some problem due to which oxygen and hemoglobin are not binding properly it can be due to any kind of poisoning it can be due to any kind of uh, another receptor may be present it can be due to any reason of any other uh, ox any other gas may be present which has more affinity to bind with hemoglobin rather than oxygen next one we have carbon monoxide in carbon monoxide poisoning what happens is that oxygen doesn't bind carbon monoxide starts binding to all those uh, receptors and when carbon monoxide levels go up oxygen carrying capacity goes down ischemic heart disease will happen next one we have cyanide poisoning same mechanism that it will bind to all of those receptors it won't let oxygen bind to hemoglobin and even if it let lets that happen the cyanide levels go up now the hemoglobin dissociation curve has gone down and now the blood or the blood does not contain that much oxygen to supply the heart and when the heart is not supplied with oxygen we all know what happens ischemic heart disease are the consequences next on now we talked about decreased supply of oxygen before now let's talk about increased demand of oxygen before this the problem was the problem was lying with the blood and oxygen either the blood is not enough either the content of oxygen in that blood is not enough now we're going to talk about no the blood is fine the oxygen is fine but the demand of oxygen has increased 
if it was getting 8 out of 10 before now it wants 10 out of 10 the demand of oxygen in the heart has gone up it happens in uh, hypertension it happens in other kind of diseases in which uh, the heart is pumping more than the normal uh, pumping rate so it includes includes hypertension as i already told you now at a hypertensive patients they have a for example blood pressure of 160 by 90 so they need more pumping they need more pumping to sustain that pressure even to decrease their pressure now for more pumping the heart will need more oxygen the demand this, this word the demand of oxygen will go up so that will lead to ischemic heart disease if, hip, if hypertension is too severe if it goes to, into hypertensive emergency or urgency next time we have valvular stenosis or insufficiency due to any kind of stenosis or insufficiency the valves are not doing their function this will lead to uh, decreased blood supply decreased cardiac output that will lead to decreased blood in the coronary vessels and when the coronary vessels are affected what will happen blood won't be able to reach blood won't be able to provide uh, the heart with enough oxygen and patient will suffer from ischemic heart disease next on we have hyperthyroidism in hyperthyroidism a patient who suffers from hyperthyroidism will have higher cardiac output will have higher heart rate it's totally normal we have seen th hyperthyroid patients with a heart rate of 80 90 now in those patients the cardiac demand of oxygen has increased because it's pumping at, at a very higher rate and in order for the patient to get better what we have to do is treat the hyperthyroidism before then go on to the heart the heart will uh, go back to normal on its own or will treat it next time we have fever in fever what happens in fever cardiac output increases in fever the body temperature goes up all of those conditions need more and more oxygen for the heart for this pumping activity and if this need is not met patient will lead to ischemic heart disease next time we have thiamine deficiency and thiamine deficiency cardiac output also increases but the effects are not because of thiamine deficiency this cardiac output is not because of thiamine deficiency due to thiamine deficiency what happens is that the supply need of heart uh, of oxygen increases and when that increases the heart the heart needs to provide its own self with enough oxygen and if it doesn't what happens uh, ischemic heart disease will happen next time we have catecholamines catecholamines are epinephrine norepinephrine all of those substances which increase the heart rate beyond a specific level in fight or flight situations and when they happen heart needs more and more oxygen for this pumping activity for dealing with this fight or flight mode and for that heart needs more and more oxygen coming from its own blood and when those needs are not met what happens ischemic heart disease next time we have atherosclerosis and thrombosis so this is a patient now these are the vessels these are the coronary vessels which are present now this is a normal blood flow this is a vessel the lumen is totally fine there is no blockage whatsoever lumen is totally fine the blood is coming in the blood is going out everything is totally fine now look at this one now this is atherosclerosis at atherosclerosis you can see this plaque it's narrowing the whole lumen it's blocking the blood supply when the lumen is narrow when the supply is being blocked atherosclerosis will be happening now how does atherosclerosis happen due to any kind of endothelial injury the inflammatory cells and all those lipid cells and all those neutrophils they start accumulating and accumulating and accumulating we have talked about all the risk factors which people are more prone to it and how do those things uh, get to form the atherosclerosis plaque now this will lead to formation of atherosclerosis now if anything takes off from it becomes a thrombus and then goes on from it and become an emboli and block another vessel that's the pathophysiology of this atherosclerosis further on it becomes those things so uh, when atherosclerosis happens the lumen is narrower now the blood supply is the same but the lumen is narrow so the, this blood won't be able to pass through completely and it will lead to consequences it will lead to ischemic heart disease next time we have thromboemboli 
Now look at this slide. This is a slide of left anterior descending artery. Okay, left anterior descending artery. You can see these uh, stains, but what you have to notice in this slide is this plaque, this atherosclerotic plaque present right here. So this is what it looks like when we see it, that this is the plaque and look at it. It has comprised over at least 30 to 40% of the lumen of the vessel. When 30 to 40% of the lumen of the vessel has been comprised of atherosclerotic plaque, the heart won't be getting enough blood, the heart won't be getting enough oxygen and the results, we all know the results, it will lead to ischemic heart disease. Next one we have coronary collateral circulation. So what happens if uh, any kind of uh, atherosclerosis happens, thrombus happens, emboli happens and the blood supply of the heart is compromised or one vessel is blocked 30%, 40%, 50% or even 80%. So the collaterals start developing. Collaterals are already there. Some collaterals are already there, but they're not active because there's no pressure gradient between them. And there's no pressure gradient. The heart gets the blood supply from its own vessels, from the vessels which are supposed to provide with the blood. But when, when those main vessels are blocked some way or any one of them gets blocked, the collateral circulation starts they start acting because now there's a pressure gradient due to that plaque due to that blockage now there's a pressure gradient and collaterals will start developing to provide the heart with enough oxygen supply so that heart might sustain its function now this is a normal circulation in which the heart, blood is going in both direction now what happens is now the collaterals have developed you can see these collaterals now this is a normal supply, the heart, the blood will go in this way, this will go in this way, but it will supply its own, it, it will supply its own region of the heart, this will supply its own region of the heart. There was no collateral between them. But due to this atherosclerotic plaque, now this blood also has to supply this because it's not getting enough blood out of here to supply that area of the heart. So this blood supply will come in this lesser blood supply will come in now this blood supply will go on and uh, go on and supply its own region of the heart while giving some blood to this part to this vessel so that this heart or this part of the heart won't go into ischemia so this is what collateral development looks like for example we have we know about two vessels which supply the heart which are left anterior descending artery and right coronary artery so if there's any blockage in left descending artery, what right coronary artery does is that it develops these collateral circulations to supply the left anterior descending artery with the blood so that the heart won't go into ischemia. That's how the collaterals develop due to some kind of blockage due to the pressure gradient which forms due to this blockage. Now these are the collateral blood vessels you can see these were not here before now they're going to go in and uh, combine with this vessel which is getting less blood supply other conditions that limit coronary blood flow we talked about three reasons up till now we talked about it can be atherosclerosis we talked about it can be thrombosis that we talked about it can be emboli we talked about it can be vasospasm we talked about that it can be because of other reasons too it we talked about that uh, increased oxygen demand might be there all of those reasons and now we're going to talk about what other conditions are there that limit the coronary blood flow first of all we have coronary arthritis now this is a pathology in which coron in which the blood supply of the coronary uh, flow is compromised next one we have syphilitic aortitis now this happens at the nodal areas at basically at the start of uh, aorta and it won't let uh, the uh, it won't let the coronary circulation get its maximum blood supply by blocking some of them by blocking their supply next time we have dissectic aortic aneurysm we know what aortic aneurysm is this vessel is torn the blood will start going from here and this is how the development of aortic aneurysm starts so if aortic aneurysm is happening the blood is going in there which is 
of no use it will so the blood supply of the coronary vessels will go down the supply of the heart will go down and will lead to ischemia one way or another next on we have congenital anomalous in which there's any problem in the heart itself we cannot do anything about it and that will also lead to ischemic heart disease and last but not the least an intramural course of LAD what is an intramural course of left anterior descending artery intramural course of left anterior descending artery means that left anterior descending artery is going on its own and for a time being it dips inside the muscle and then comes out when it dips inside the muscle what happens during the contraction of the muscles that blood supply that vessel is compressed when it's compressed because of that contraction it won't be able to supply the heart with the maximum blood supply or the amount of oxygen which is needed for its sustainment won't be supplied and it will lead to ischemia next now we have effects of ischemic heart disease what are going to be the effects of ischemic heart disease now we talked about these are the vessels and they're going to supply the heart the coronary vessels and this you can see this is atherosclerosis thrombus formation is happening so what are going to be the effects first of all angina pectoris what is angina pectoris before i move on to angina pectoris i have to tell you when this happens when the lumen of the vessel is being compromised until the point it reaches its 75 percent until the point it reaches uh, that this blockage is up to 75 percent of the lumen surface there will be no symptoms at all patient will be fine but when it reaches 75 percent when it blocks 75 percent of the lumen what happens afterwards patient is going to have severe crushing chest pain and that chest pain will be substernal and it will be leading from here to the jawline and from here to the left arm the whole arm will be affected jawline will be affected and crushing chest pain will be present at substernal place now this is called angina pectoris this lasts for 1 to 15 minutes not more than that it lasts for 1 to 15 minutes and it uh, is controlled by giving the person the rest if a person sits down it settles down mostly it happens because if a person is doing some heavy work and the heart needs more and more blood and when this is compromised and 75 percent of the lumen is compromised how in the hell that those coronary vessels are going to supply the heart with increased oxygen or increased blood supply if it's compromised even uh, at its maximum it won't be able to provide the heart with enough oxygen or nourishment so when that happens uh, the heart is going into angina angina is pain angina pectoris will come in the, if we ask the patient to sit down relax the patient will be fine because now the demand of the oxygen of the heart has gone down when the demand of the oxygen of the heart has gone down heart doesn't need more of oxygen or more of blood it needs exact amount of blood it was getting before so the pain will settle in but patients have these pains recurrence because now 75 percent of the area is already compromised they'll get this pain for example this pain has lasted more than 15 minutes for example this spam has uh, this uh, patch or this lumen blockage has gone more than 75 percent or there's some repeated kind of angina what will happen mi myocardial infarction will happen if this goes on for more than 15 minutes and leads to degeneration of myocytes when myocytes are dead when they're not supplied with enough oxygen for a very long time they, this will lead to myocardial infarction and myocardial infarction has different types and those types depend upon which vessel has been affected and which vessel has been affected means if if it's left anterior descending artery it means it's going to be anterior left kind of uh, mi we're going to talk about in detail about these mi's and its type but for now which vessel is going to be affected determines the type of mi when mi happens those cells are dead those cells won't be able to function properly and if large area of the heart is affected heart won't be able to function properly at all the pumping action of the heart is gone because now one part or two parts or three parts of the heart are not even pumping they are dead 
So this will lead to chronic congestive heart failure. Now myocardial infarction led to chronic congestive heart failure because the heart is not pumping properly. The organs are not getting enough blood supply. The heart has now failed. Most of its area are, is most of its myocytes are dead. So this all of this means that uh, patient who gets MI won't be going back to being normal in many cases because they have this dead tissue in the heart that dead tissue is not performing any kind of function if it's not performing any kind of function the heart is not pumping properly because heart works as a unit all of the cells work as a unit if one or two parts are gone now this will be a, this will be the contraction this is not enough to supply the whole body so this will lead to chronic congestive heart failure and this will lead to sudden death now in some cases angina pectoris may lead to sudden death this happens in those people who were in very young age basically who were athletes who play cricket who play football they are playing and they're uh, they don't know about uh, this blockage inside their heart this blockage inside their coronary vessels and they are playing and suddenly the heart needs more and more blood supply and those vessels are permanently blocked it will lead to sudden death or chronic congestive failure will lead to sudden death next time we have effects of ischemic heart disease now first of all let's talk about angina pectoris we just talked about angina pectoris that if 75 percent of the lumen has been affected we're going to have these substernal chest pains we're going to have these pains which go up to the jawline we are going to have these pains which go on to the sh your shoulder onto the left arm this whole area will be affected and when we ask the patient to rest or give the patient nitroglycerin remember the word nitroglycerin when that's given it's a vaso uh, dilator so it will dilate the vessels when it will dilate the vessels the more blood will be able to go through and the more blood will be, will be able to go through the patient will feel at ease we talked about blood flow reduced by more than 75 percent so next time we have effect of ischemic heart disease regarding angina pectoris is that severe coronary atherosclerosis will lead to decreased coronary blood flow will lead to coronary vasospam will lead to aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency now these are the effects of ischemic heart disease now coronary vasospam mean there's any kind of uh, indicator or any kind of uh, problem due to which coronary vessel spam happened. Now those lumens have decreased. Now that will lead to angina pectoris, aortic stenosis. If aorta, aortic valve is stenosed, it won't be able to give enough blood supply. And that will lead to angina pectoris and if there's any aortic insufficiency. Now all of these lead to angina pectoris, which leads to myo cytolytic degeneration of myocardium those cells are dying now and it will lead to mi further because if cells are dying if cells are dead it will lead to myocardial infarction next time we have prince metal angina what is prince metal angina let's talk about prince metal angina it happens due to coronary artery visus spam it happens due to coronary artery visus spam and this is what it looks like on ecg when you go through ECG, when we go through ECG, you can see they're not at all the same PQR complexes. They are different PQR complexes will be seen. And in some pathologies, you will be able to see this kind of pattern in which PQR will be altered with another spike. Now, all of this pathology will be seen in Prince Metal Angina. Now, Prince Metal Angina is not your typical angina. It's not because of any kind of blockage. It's because of some coronary vasospam and it gets better on its own. It, it doesn't lead to death proper, uh, in, uh, immediately. It has its own effects. Next now we have unstable angina. Unstable angina means if a person is sleeping or walking or sitting, it gets these pains. These are called unstable anginas and they develop due to plaques and coronary artery. When there are plaques in coronary artery and the coronary artery is not able to supply the heart with enough oxygen, this leads to unstable angina. Effects of ischemic heart disease, sudden death. Now this 
is the most skeptical effect of ischemic heart disease otherwise we learned how it goes to first it goes to uh, mi then it goes to congestive cardiac failure then further on it goes to sudden death but in some cases it leads to sudden death on itself i told you that this happened in patients who were playing cricket or playing football or very young and they have a very normal heart rate they have a very normal heart sound they have a very normal ecg but the plaques are formed there or some kind of blockages there and they don't know about it their blood vessel is about to collapse due to this narrowing and they don't know about it because they're young and they don't need that much oxygen and when they're playing the heart demand of the oxygen goes up when the heart demand of the oxygen goes up that patient will have angina severe crushing chest pain which is substernal going up to the jaw line going to the left arm dyspnea patient won't be, able, won't be able to breathe properly patient will feel like i'm not breathing enough because oxygen demand is increased dyspnea will happen more and more oxygen is consumed more and more oxygen is required patient will feel dyspneic patient will feel this fatigue then what will happen headache will start happening because now the cells of the heart are dying they're not pumping properly when they're not pumping properly hypoperfusion of other systems will start and that leads to headache and uh, immediately they're brought to emergency uh, hospitals but before they get there sudden death happens because now this vessel has collapsed prop- collapsed properly it has completely blocked it and now the heart, that part of the heart for example if it's that part of the heart it's blocked now it's not function if the left ventricle is not function what else uh, not functioning what else is there to supply the bl- uh, supply the body with the blood supply next on we have subendocardial or transmural myocardial infarcts now they are two different kind of infarcts we're going to differentiate between them before that we have to know that this is epicardium this is left ventricular chamber first of all this is epicardium and this is subendocardium and this is subendocardial infarction it means it involves this layer subendocardial layer is involved by subendocardial infarction on the other hand transmural infarction includes do both of them epicardium and subendocardium so let's differentiate them on a table so that we might get the more idea about their differences first of all you can see subendocardial is multifocal on the other hand this is unifocal in more cases but let's learn about subendocardial infarct before this is multifocal it's patchy in appearance it may be circumferential it may be circumferential like this it may involve the whole circumference in this condition coronary thrombosis is rare because it's present inside of it it's not affecting the lumen of the vessel so coronary thrombosis is rare no epicarditis not any kind of pathology like epicarditis or myocarditis is happening in subendocardial infarcts and often results from hypotension or shock and it results from hypotension or shock blood supply goes down and it leads to subendocardial infarct no aneurysms or ventricular rupture is seen in subendocardial infarct on the other hand just like subendocardial infarct was multifocal transmural infarcts are unifocal these are patchy they are solid they were circumferential but these are not and they often happen because of shock too they happen because of shock this also happens because of shock coronary thrombosis is common now in subendocardial infarct coronary thrombosis is not happening at all now in transmural infarct coronary thrombosis is common because it involves more of the surface area it involves more of the area it can just break off and go somewhere else and thrombus formation and emboli formation may lead because of it epicarditis is common it does affect the other or other areas in distribution of specific coronary artery and aneurysms or ventricular rupture is common in this aneurysm will be happening because it weakens the wall it weakens the wall up to that point that aneurysm can happen 
that wall can just rupture and the blood will go from down there the blood will think that it's the place to go it's another artery or supply the blood will go in it will just break it off so aneurysms and ruptures and uh, coronary thrombosis all of this is common in transmural infarcts so transmural infarcts are way too dangerous than subendocardial infarcts next now we have myocardial infarction development of myocardial infarction first of all we have a now this is normal this is a normal cardiac myocyte all of it is normal all of these cells are functioning properly they have no problem whatsoever then myocardial infarction happened and this is a picture after 12 to 18 hours of myocardial infection so in this picture you can see the eosinophilia and you can see these nucleuses these striations have gone now this is a dead area and it, it is happening of 12 to 18 hours and you can see the eosinophilic presence of it next on after the one day what happens is the polymorphonuclear uh, neutrophils will come in and they will be seen with the dead myocyte after one day further on we'll have three weeks of uh, we can see the diagram which happened after what happens after three weeks after three weeks it is composed of granulation tissue at the dead myocyte level it's composed of granulation tissue which includes macrophages which includes fibroblasts which includes neutrophils which includes all of these structures and they will lead to the formation of this what happened after three months after three months what happens you can see all of this dead tissue is present you can see this fibroblast embedded in them but this is a scar formation you can see that scar is formed this is dead tissue now this is not working properly this is not functioning properly this is not functioning as a pump so this is what myocardial infarction leads to the dead tissue the scar will be formed this won't be working as a pump next on we have microscopic features you can see these microscopic features right here that what areas have been affected what areas have been necrosed you can see this and this points these points have been mentioned here right here that this these were the points that got affected and led to the formation of myocardium myocardial infarction next on we have these microscopic features in which amd amd m amd m n s n what does these structures mean you, you know all of these things we say now these are the structures this is the area which has been necrosed which has which is dead which is not working properly now this has been shown through your microscope that all of these areas which get affected because of myocardial infarction look like this on a microscopic diagram or a microscopic feature in this slide the necrotic myocardial fibers which are divided of any nucleus are present in the immense density of inflammatory cells this is what it looks like on microscope if you see uh, a slide of uh, myocardial infarctive tissue so these uh, myocardial fibers will be embedded which are, is which are which have no nucleus which are embedded in acute inflammatory cells next on to differentiate the which cells are affected and which cells are not we stain it with collagen now this is a collagen stained uh, histological slide and these are the dead area which are stained with collagen they have no nucleus they have no uh, property as whatever but they are demarcated from all those areas from all those myofibrils from all those myocardial cells which are still viable which are functioning properly so this is how we define which areas are working properly and which areas are working not properly we stain them with the collagen now in this slide a section of infarcted myocardium shows prominent thick wavy transverse myofilaments present in the condition of myocardial infarctions next now we have clinical features of ischemic heart disease what will the patient be presenting to you with first of all there will be severe crushing substernal or pericardial pain which is due to angina we talked about angina pectoris which will be due to angina pectoris then you will have epigastric burning we'll have sweating we'll have nausea we'll have vomiting and then shortness of breath 
all of these will be the clinical features which will with which ischemic heart disease patient will be presenting to you with all of these symptoms crushing pains and epigastric burning you'll feel that it's epigastric burning the patient will be sweating a lot because patient is not getting enough oxygen patient is going through a lot patient's heart is failing blood supply is failing patient will be sweating patient will have nausea patient will feel like to vomit and patient will be short of breath because patient is suffering from ischemic heart disease so body needs more and more oxygen for supply so patient will be shortness of patient will be short of breath next on we have complications what if the patient who had ischemic heart disease survived what complications would it have it will have arrhythmias when the one part of the heart has necrosed or is dead now it's not working as a pump now one area is not working properly so it will lead to the now this will be like this this or this some kind of that kind of arrhythmia in which uh, we will talk about arrhythmias in detail so this will lead to arrhythmia this will lead to left ventricular failure and cardiogenic shock if left ventricle is affected and it's not pumping properly it will lead to left ventricular failure and cardiogenic shock next time we have extension of the infarct the infarct will extend and then uh, thrombus will form then emboli will form and that infarct or that emboli will may lead to some kind of uh, cva so cva can happen because of it now these are the complications of ischemic heart disease how it leads to all of these problems next on we have rupture of the free wall of the myocardium free wall of the myocardium can be ruptured because of it because it weakens the wall and it may lead to rupture next on we have other forms of myocardial ruptures in which the walls weaken and it leads to the rupture of the wall because of the high blood pressure or because of this urge of the blood to pass through next on we have pericarditis which pericardium will be affected in the in will be inflamed and the blood will be coming in and pooling in and it can lead to pericarditis too afterwards we have aneurysm in which true aneurysm and false aneurysm are there and then we have mural thrombosis and embolism before i move on i want you to know what a true aneurysm is i want you to know what a false aneurysm is what a true aneurysm is that it breaks the wall goes into the wall basically it goes into the wall and then comes back this is true aneurysm in some cases it comes back in some cases it starts storing right there in false aneurysm you can see this photo depicts it, it goes in and then in this way it would be coming back this is false aneurysm the blood is not going all the way the blood is not going all the time it's just showing next on we have mural thrombosis and embolism mural thrombosis means that thrombus will be formed it can block the mural area and embolism that thrombus can detach itself from that surface it can move on to anywhere inside the body any vessel inside the body and it may lead to cva or it may lead to any kind of uh, uh, blockage of the vessel which leads to the blood supply of any basic organ like liver or uh, lungs or something like that and it may lead may lead to the ischemia of their uh, them organs so this is basically what we have so what we learned in this lecture is what ischemic heart disease is what are the risk factors what patients or what people are more prone to get the ischemic heart disease what are the risk factors and with those risk factors we can know that we can remove those risk factors by putting some effort into it for example if we leave the smoking for example if we do something about our body for example if we change our personality from a to b we don't worry so much we don't exaggerate things so much then we talked about how angina pectoris may lead to myocardial infarction then myocardial infarction leads to congestive cardiac failure and then congestive cardiac failure leads to sudden death we talked about how a patient who's suffering from uh, just angina pectoris may lead directly to the death if it's collapsed and there's no way that only a minute amount of blood can go through then we talked about what myocardial infarction uh, will be looking like on the slide we have to know that it has those transverse bands it is it's filled with these uh, neutrophils in the start then all of those uh, granulation tissues will come in and they will form a scar there then we uh, talked about how if we look at a microscopic uh, slide of uh, any patient who just suffered from myocardial infarction it will be immersed with acute inflammatory cells 
Then we talked about what are the complications. Okay, ischemic heart disease did happen. What are the complications of it? We talked about the complications that it may lead to aneurysms, it may lead to a rupture of the walls, it may lead to thrombosis, it may lead to embolism. So that's all for ischemic heart disease. And uh, we'll talk about the complications and uh, the recurrence of this in the further lectures. Thank you for watching Skyler.com.